We've talked about a lot of things, and we've talked about how things play out, how ear infections come from not being able to breathe through your nose properly, how a lot of other things come from not being able to do this and that. That's the way that we think. We think analytically. If there is a problem, we take it apart, we look at the elements in the problem, and we say, here's where the problem is. We need to fix it. So if we can't breathe through our nose, we need to figure out a way to breathe through our nose. But it's not that simple. That's a cookie cutter man. That's a linear thinking. Connect the dots. We're not that way. We're more complex than that. So if we can't breathe through our nose, there's a lot of things that we can do to help us breathe through our nose, like the probiotics that we've talked about, like you know all the other things that we can do, even the moving your head while you <laughs> <clears throat> helps open your nose. So we are complex. We are not this mechanical cookie cutter person, and we all know that. But we think in these terms because we have to, because our society demands that we know who's responsible for screwing up the mess. And you can't have responsibility, you can't parse out responsibility if you have interconnections like this. So a nose is one of those little yellow balls in there. It's connected to a whole bunch of other things. And those other things play a part in what happens. We're interconnected, we're networked. When you have a network, you don't have clear responsibility. You can't figure out what's going on. You need what you can do to interact with this system somewhere, and then see what happens with that interaction. That's dealing with complex systems. And we are far more complex even than this, because this kind of system can't adapt. And every living organism, tree or animal, has some ability, even bacteria, has some ability to read their environment and adapt to it. That's a totally different way of thinking than how we think in our world today. And clear, the use of nasal xylitol, has a tremendous part in changing the way we think because we adapt. And these people wrote this book some time ago, and this is, I think, how we can approach this change and how we can stimulate this change because they showed us that the symptoms that we have are there for a reason. And they are either defenses, in which case we have a survival value, or they're manipulations, in which case the bacteria that inhabit us have a greater survival value. For example, malaria. We get a fever. That fever is so high that we lay down and are wonderful targets for hungry mosquitoes. How do you interrupt that? with bed nets, with stuff you wipe on your arms that smells like garlic, with screens on your windows like we did after TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, and we had an epidemic of malaria in the United States. Um, cholera causes profuse watery diarrhea, and you treat that by interrupting that transmission by cleaning up the water, by washing your hands more often when you're associated with, these pe with people that have that. The Plexus Institute, which is where I'm giving this presentation the next couple months from now, um, has a program they call Positive Deviance, where they encourage everyone that works in a hospital situation to think and to do what they can in a different way to make sure that they interrupt the spread and the transmission of 
He says, you're doing that with what you're doing. Also, what these people forget is what Paul Ewald tells us is that when we interrupt this process of transmission, we actually put pressure on the bacteria, on the infecting organism, to adapt in a friendlier way. The primary example that I know of that is with xylitol and tooth. Because we've heard a lot of discussion about how xylitol makes the strep mutans go away. But sometimes strep mutans eats xylitol, learns not to eat it anymore, and what do they do when they learn not to eat it? They don't make acid anymore. That's a friendly adaptation. But we don't talk much about that. We should, because we're actually putting pressure on these bacteria to be more friendly. Can we do that with strep pneumo? Yes. Yes, we can, and strep pneumo now kills hundreds of thousands of people in the United States and millions worldwide every year. We can make it more friendly. Interrupting transmission leads to that same thing. And so does interrupting adherence. Nathan Sharon uh, died last year, pioneered looking at how bacteria attach to us. And what he found was that bacteria have a sweet tooth. The one that he looked at mostly was mannose and E. coli, the bacteria that causes most urinary tract infections. If you put mannose in the environment where E. coli, the kind that holds on to mannose and the kind that makes all the urinary tract infections, if you put mannose in that environment, you will change out that bacteria to the kind that doesn't cause urinary tract infections. So if you have a woman that is having a lot of urinary tract infections, give her a teaspoon of mannose three times a day, it changes out the E. coli in your GI tract, which is where most infections come from, and her urinary tract infections will improve. Easy. If you have, well, that's the rest of the story. You can do this with xylitol, like the Finnish researchers showed. A 5% solution of xylitol changes out 68% of strep pneumo. Strep pneumo is a major pathogen that lives in our nose, so change it out. Use clear. Easy. Manipulations need to be interrupted. Interrupting adherence is just as effective as interrupting transmission. So we don't talk about that because sugars don't make it anywhere. Both make for a friendlier playing field. These are two successful defenses. Our defenses are strongest, just like any other complex adaptive organism, like a hockey team. Our defenses are strongest where we are weakest and most vulnerable. That's the openings to our body. Our GI tract on the right, when we do things that interrupt and is insult our GI tract, we have defenses that pay for that, correct that. When we have a runny nose, it's a defense. Okay, so the message of those defenses is just don't hobble them. This horse's defenses are primarily running. If there's a predator out there, this horse is going to run away. If you hobble your defense, that horse is going to be a meal. If he's hobbled where there's predators around. So don't hobble defenses. Strengthen them, support them. Probably the best example of a defense that was treated wrong is bloodletting. Bloodletting, we, we had this, it was the symbol of medicine, what is today the stethoscope, for more than 3,000 years. It was a very successful, they thought, treatment. And it was a treatment for too much blood. The signs and symptoms of too much blood are redness, swelling, fever, pain. What are those that we know today? The ruber dolor calorin tumor of the, of the inflammatory response. What's the inflammatory response? It's our primary defense for infection and injury. 
It means that there, your body recognizes something wrong, so it opens the blood vessels, so you get the redness and the swelling. Those blood vessels are there in case of injury to splint it, in case of infection to bring all of the blood-borne defenses that help fight the infection. So what happens when you bleed somebody? All of those signs and symptoms go away. Fantastic treatment for the signs and symptoms. But then we asked what happened, some French people got a wise idea, and they asked what happened when you treated pneumonia with bloodletting. And what did they find? More people died. And there's a revolutionary era physician from London. His name was John Letzem. He wrote a little poem about himself that says, I, John Letzem, blisters, bleeds, and sweats em. If after that they choose to die, I, John Letzem. <laughs> so people knew about it even back then. They knew there was a risk. They knew that it didn't work all the time. And then the French proved it. But it still took 100 years to die because we were still bleeding people in the flu epidemic after World War I. Long time, long learning curve, too long. But we did learn, except we didn't learn the value and the importance of not hobbling defenses. We still do it. In the 1940s, we found that histamine was the major trigger for a runny nose and all the nasal congestion. So we developed antihistamines. And they were considered so safe that we put them on the market where people could buy them over the counter. They started being advertised on TV. What do they do? They turn off our defenses. They hobble our defenses. When the FDA finally figured that out in 2007, the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, kowtowed within months because they knew too. But nobody tells us. You know, why did they take these off the market? Because they're harmful for kids. But adults can still buy them. If they're harmful for kids, they're probably harmful for adults. They hobble our nasal defense. If you have shock, yeah, more people die. Don't hobble defenses. A fever is a defense. It helps our immune system. It speeds it up, soups it up. It makes it harder for germs to multiply. It optimizes our immune system, and it kills some germs. Primary defenses are usually not noticeable. The acid in our stomach, our, the friendly bacteria in our stomach, they're all part of our gastrointestinal defenses, and they work without us knowing it. But secondary defenses, like the kind you didn't like to look at, we know about because our immune system and our body says maybe there's something you can do to help here. Something is going wrong. So how do you help? Well, the way you optimize the gastrointestinal defenses is with oral rehydration. Um, oral rehydration started in the 1960s in what is now Bangladesh, and they used it as a treatment for cholera. They found out that they could keep the tank full despite the profuse watery diarrhea that cholera causes. They could keep the, keep the tank full, they could deal with the problem and let your body deal with the problem in this healthy getting rid of everything that it doesn't want. And it worked. Ten years after it began to be used, the editors of Lancet uh, um, stated it was the most, one of the most significant advances in medicine in the last century. That's a pretty good track record. In 10 years, it saved more lives than penicillin had in 40. But people don't know about it because it's made up of sugar, salt, and water. Sugar being glucose. The way it works, it turns a little pump on in your stomach called the sodium glucose transport system that pumps water into your body actively. I tried to find some here in town for Dr. Mackinnon the other day, and we finally had to kibosh some of the the 
Powerade thing and figure out how to dilute it to make it into something like this. So in your talking, in your writing, talk about our defenses and talk about the importance of not hobbling them. And if Clear is interested in taking a track of, of looking at our defenses and marketing Clear as a way to not hobble our defense and to help optimize our defense, then talk to the people at Giannis Brothers in, in uh, wherever they are, Kansas City, Missouri, where I graduated from medical school. And, you know, because they don't have a marketing outlet very much. So nobody knows about it. And they don't know about it because it doesn't make any money. And it can't be made into a drug because you can make it in your kitchen. Okay, airway defenses. This is a primary airway defense. It's made up of the mucus that hangs onto all the garbage we breathe, the little microscopic hairs called cilia that sweep the garbage out, sweep the mucus out to down our throat where we swallow it. And it happens all the time, and it's not a problem. Critical in both of those functionings is the airway surface fluid. It provides space for the cilia to sweep, and it provides water for the mucus because the mucus is secreted here in very concentrated form, and it rapidly absorbs almost 200 times its volume when it is secreted to become the wet, sticky stuff that we can sweep out and that is so sticky that it hangs on to everything. So critical is the airway surface fluid. This next slide shows the difference. This is humidity, and you probably can't read the figures, but this is 40%, this is 60%. This is optimal humidity. When you have dry air, you have more bacteria, you have more viruses, you have more respiratory infections. Because, why? Because I think the amount of water in the air that we breathe plays a part in our airway surface fluid. And our airway surface fluid doesn't work if it's dry. If you have moist air, you don't have as much a problem with respiratory infections right in here. Not enough data. So how do we get this? And what's happened? We've seen an increase in respiratory infection since 1960s, that's been about 5% per year steady increases in sinus infections, in ear infections, in asthma, in allergies. What happened? Well, one of the things I've already mentioned, we got antihistamines over, uh, over the counter, so, and they started being advertised on TV. But the other thing that happened is that our nice, comfortable homes in 1965, 50% of them then had central air, central air and heating. What happens when you cool the air? You drop the moisture. What happens when you heat the air? You drop the ability of that air to hold water. So either way, in our nice, comfortable environments, you're hobbling your nasal defenses. And you hobble those defenses and we pay the price in these increases in infections. So what do you do? Use clear. Histamine does four things. It increases the water supply to wash out your nose. It makes more mucus to grab onto the garbage. It's an irritant, so we sneeze like Shiloh here, just before his dad took the picture. Shiloh sneezed and produced these nice mucus pitcher. Lovely picture. And it shuts down the airway, which is what we know as asthma. But people don't think of it that way. How do you treat this? Well, saline adds fluid briefly. Neti pots work, but they're like douching. And I'll say a word about that. I know Neti Clear likes Neti Clear, and people use Neti pots. But if you're educating people, we don't tell women to douche anymore because the third opening of our body is the female genital tract. And the primary defense in the female genital tract is this lovely biofilm we've been talking about. 
Biofilm can be a defense in the female genital tract as much as in the stomach. It's also a defense in your nose. What happens when you douche? You wash out that biofilm. You disturb that defense. What happens when you use a neti pot in your nose? You're washing out that defense. It's something that I think makes sense, and it's something that I would encourage you and you're talking to your people and educating your people to talk about as well. Because it's better to tweak those environments if something's wrong with them. And see what this little effect that you are doing. And xylitol has a little effect on the bacteria. If you talk to the bacteria a lot, like when these little kids drink the water that has a little bit of xylitol in it, they're talking to the bacteria on their teeth. You know, it doesn't take much, but it takes the message repeated over and over and over before the bacteria can get it. And if they get it, then we will know, and more people will know, and we will overcome this problem because people can understand it. Thank you.